processed and transferred within this neuronal network is really important to be able to understand how um, we can think and, and how we, we can control our behavior. And within a neuron, which is the specialized cell in the, in the brain, um, communication happens via electric impulses. So changes in the membrane potential resulting from the influx and outflow of ions through the cell membrane, right? But communication between neurons happens uh, via so-called chemical conduction um, at uh, the uh, synaptic buttons, which are composed of the presynaptic neuron, uh, the one which has information to pass on, and the postsynaptic uh, or target neuron. And we've got the extracellular space between these two neurons, which is called the synaptic cleft. And um, the presynaptic neuron synthesizes and releases chemical substances, so so-called neurotransmitters, which are recognized by uh, protein complexes um, expressed on the membrane of the postsynaptic neuron. And these protein complexes are the receptors, right? So this is why neurotransmitters and their receptors are actually really important elements in uh, connectivity in the brain, although when people talk about connectivity, they normally think about axons and, and fiber tracts. There are very many different kinds of uh, neurotransmitters in the brain. And today I am going to talk about the so-called classical uh, neurotransmitters because they are the ones that are present at the highest absolute concentrations in the brain. We've got different kinds of classical neurotransmitters. Glutamate and GABA are the so-called ubiquitous uh, neurotransmitters because they can be uh, synthesized by cells that are found anywhere in the brain. And in contrast, we've got other neurotransmitters such as acetylcholine, dopamine, noradrenaline, or serotonin, um, which are uh, each produced by a small number of neurons in the brain. And the cell bodies of these neurons are grouped into subcortical nuclei, the location of which is schematically represented by the ovals in this um, slide. And um, the, these neurons, although their cell bodies have a very specific location in the brain, they can release the neurotransmitters that they produce anywhere in the brain because they have very, very long axons, uh, which are represented here by, by the arrows, okay? Now, just the same as the fact that we've got very many different um, neurotransmitters, there are also very many different kinds of receptors in the brain, and they can be classified uh, based on different criteria. So one of them being their neurotransmitter specificity. So do they bind to the neurotransmitter GABA or glutamate or whatever? And they can also be uh, classified based on um, their outcome. And here we distinguish um, if activation of the receptor results in a change in the membrane potential, which um, facilitates the, um, the start of an action potential, um, or if um, the activation of the receptor results um, in um, changes in the membrane potential that make it harder for um, the excitatory influences to uh, start neuronal firing, okay? So the first case would be an excitatory receptor that would um, facilitate neuronal firing and inhibitory uh, receptors would, would um, stop, make this more difficult. And receptors can also be classified based on how they cause these changes in membrane potential. And the main differences between ionotropic and metabotropic mechanisms of action is that the ionotropic receptors are actually also ion channels 
spanning the cell membrane, uh, whereas activation of metabotropic receptors starts a cascade of events, which ultimately also results um, in the opening of, of ion channels, but the receptor itself isn't an ion channel. And this is why um, metabotropic receptors mediate a slower um, mechanisms or changes than ionotropic receptors do. And they're also more widespread because activation of a single metabotropic receptor can result in the opening of multiple ion channels in the surrounding membrane, okay? Now, with this very colorful slide, which really does not represent a comprehensive list of all the different kinds of receptors that we know exist in the brain, um, I, I want to make obvious that a given neurotransmitter can bind to different kinds of receptors and that each one of these receptors has a specific outcome uh, and mechanism of action, right? And this means that a, a single neurotransmitter can modulate the activation uh, levels of targeted neurons in multiple ways. And this diversity is basically uh, what enables um, the plasticity in the um, neuronal networks which, which um, subserve brain function. Um, in this slide, you'll also see that, that next to some of the neurotransmitters, I've written the word neuromodulatory or modulatory. Um, that is because these receptors bind to excitatory or inhibitory receptors, okay? So depending on the type of, of receptor that they bind to, acetylcholine, for example, can have an excitatory or an inhibitory effect on the target neuron. Whereas glutamate and GABA are excitatory or inhibitory because they can only bind to, you know, excitatory or inhibitory receptors, right? Um, in vivo, a single neuron is targeted by very many other neurons, right? Not just by a single neuron. And each one of these presynaptic neurons uh, expresses a specific neurotransmitter. We know that, uh, at least for classical neurotransmitters, um, a, a given neuron can only synthesize and release this one type of classical neurotransmitter, right? But because a single neuron can be targeted by neurotransmitters that express very many different kinds, uh, sorry, be targeted by neurons that express very many different kinds of neurotransmitters, this uh, neuron on its cell membrane must um, express receptors that will recognize these different um, kinds of neurotransmitters. And this is what happens in, in reality in, in the brain. Now, I mentioned earlier on that receptors are proteins, protein complexes, uh, and we've got different methods that can be used to, to analyze these um, protein um, complexes. One of them would be uh, positron emission tomography. Then we also have quantitative in vitro receptor autoradiography. We have immunohistochemistry uh, and also in zeta hybridization. Um, why would one want to choose quantitative in vitro receptor autoradiography or PET? versus immunohistochemistry or in situ hybridization, which both provide a really high spatial resolution. Well, the advantage that, that PET and, and receptor autoradiography have um, is that, that with this method, we can actually um, visualize the receptor complex in its native configuration um, that's embedded in the membrane. So, so the, the complex that can actually modulate um, neuronal function, right? Whereas with immunohistochemistry or in situ hybridization, we can only visualize um, a single subunit. Or if we use some kind of colocalization, we can um, maybe visualize two or even three subunits, but we don't know if those subunits um, are actually part of this functional receptor uh, protein complex, okay? And the advantage of 
in vitro receptor autoradiography over PET is that it has a much higher resolution and it's fully quantifiable. And also um, that within a single tissue sample, we can anal analyze very many different receptor types. And this is something that can't be done um, in PET studies. And, and this ability to study very many different receptor types um, basically enables us to perform multimodal analysis, right, within, within a single tissue sample. Now, this slide uh, shows a series of coronal sections through a human hemisphere at the level of the central sulcus. And here, blue tones code for um, low receptor densities and red orange tones for high receptor densities. And um, these images were obtained um, using uh, receptor, the method of receptor autoradiography. And already in this overview slide, it's, it's obvious that receptors are not equally distributed throughout the brain, but that they show regionally and layer specific distribution patterns. Um, we can find differences within the cortex and also differences when we compare the cortex um, with subcortical structures. So for example, if you look at the bottom left uh, of the slide, where the alpha-1 receptors are visualized, you will see that there are really low densities in the subcortical structures. They would be located here in this position that I'm highlighting now um, with the laser pointer. Uh, and, and then you've got higher uh, densities in the cortex. And if we just move to the bottom right of the slide where we've got the dopamine one receptors, we've got exactly the opposite situation, right? With higher densities of this receptor in, in the basal ganglia than in the cortex. Right. Um, if I zoom into one of these images now, and what I've zoomed into now is the lateral fissure, which is this part here of the brain. And we can see the Hescher gyrus, that's this structure here, um, from which we know that it contains the primary auditory cortex, which is also called uh, Brodmann's area 41. And this autoradiograph shows the distribution of the muscarinic M2 receptor for acetylcholine. Now, the primary auditory cortex is characterized by a much higher density of the M2 receptors than the surrounding areas. And basically the position at which these changes in density happen uh, and, and can be determined in a statistically testable manner are highlighted by these um, two arrows here, okay? And if we compare the distribution of the M2 receptors in this part of the brain with that of the alpha-1 receptors, we see that for the alpha-1 receptor, we've got the opposite pattern in the sense that area 41 has a lower density of alpha-1 receptors than the surrounding cortex, but still we see that the changes in density happen at uh, comparable positions. Um, as you can see, if you if you compare the, the position of, of the arrows in these two uh, sections here, which are neighboring sections, right? You've got to remember that these are neighboring sections. It isn't exactly the same section in which we've labeled the different receptors. If we move on to the NMDA receptor, we see a, a different pattern, and, and that is that the NMDA receptor does not highlight the border between uh, area 41 and surrounding um, areas. Um, so this slide um, basically has two take home messages. One of them is that uh, differences in the expression levels of neurotransmitter receptors help us identify borders between cortical areas, but not all receptors necessarily show all cortical borders, right? Um, some receptor types can group uh, areas into 
what what we I'd like to think of as families of neurochemically related areas. Now, importantly, um, for the comparison of um, this kind of data with uh, classical maps, the position of borders re um, revealed by by uh, receptors um, aren't just comparable you know with it between different receptor types but they're also comparable with uh, borders that can be identified um, with classical histochemical stainings such as you know a cell body staining shown here on the very left of the slide or a myelin staining um, at the middle of the slide and here you can see also a coronal section through a human hemisphere. This is um, in the region of the calcarine sulcus. That is this uh, sulcus here. And the calcarine sulcus contains the primary visual cortex, which is characterized by the presence of uh, the so-called genari stripe, uh, which is a band of um, highly myelinated fibers that runs parallel to the surface of the cerebral cortex and, um, and is only found in a primary visual area V1, right? And exactly the position at which the genary stripe um, finishes um, here in this myelin section is the position at which this uh, a stripe with a relatively low density of the GABA-A receptors, for example, finishes, okay? So this is very important. It's not just that um, differences in receptor uh, levels um, identify, you know, receptor architectonical borders that happen at comparable positions when, when it is shown by two or more receptors, but it's also comparable to, as I said, these um, classical um, histological stainings. Another important thing about receptors is that um, they help us uh, distinguish functional systems, okay? And I'm coming back to this uh, section that I showed you um, earlier on, but now I am concentrating on the part of the section that actually shows the central sulcus, which is this one here. And we know that um, the central sulcus contains two um, functional systems. On the rostral wall of the central sulcus, we have primary motor cortex, Brotman's area four, and on the posterior wall of the central sulcus, we have primary somatosensory cortex or, you know, cytoarchitectonic area 3B. And if you compare these different sections, you will see that the, that the receptor architecture of the primary motor cortex and the primary somatosensory cortex are really, really different, okay? So you, you, we generally find that receptors which are very high in, um, you know, one of the systems are very low in the other system. So that's an example here for the muscarinic M2 or the alpha 2 receptor or the 5-HG2, the GABA-A receptor, or the opposite situation um, applies to the alpha 1 receptor, okay? So we can distinguish between functional systems here. And the third important principle um, that, that differences in the expression levels of, of receptors show is the fact that within a given sensory system, um, differences in the expression levels of receptors help us identify hierarchical processing levels, okay? So if you look at this slide here, we've got again the coronal one through the level of the central sulcus with the primary somatosensory, primary auditory cortex. And this other section here is also coronal through a human brain, but the occipital lobe, calcarin sulcus, primary visual cortex. And both sections are visualizing the M2 receptor. And you can see that in all of the primary areas, the density of this receptor is much higher than that of the neighboring areas. And the nice thing also is that these principles that I've described now for the human brain, they also apply to for other um, species. 
in varying degrees, depending on the species that you're analyzing, okay? But in the case of the macaque monkey, which is what you see here, we really have a very good correspondence telling us that the macaque monkey it would be a good model for the human brain if you want to analyze the distribution of neurotransmitter receptors, okay? So here we have the coronal section through the human brain that I just showed you earlier on, and um, one through the macaque monkey brain, also M2 receptors, and you see primary visual cortex has a really high density of the M2 receptors, which is lower in ventral secondary visual area V2. It diminishes when we go into V3 and further into V4, okay? Um, I mentioned earlier on that one of the advantages of this method is that it is fully quantifiable. Um, and what you see here is basically a table where um, I've, I've you know, listed the, the densities of, of multiple different receptor types in many different brain areas, okay? And looking for an intuitive representation of, of so much data to be able to you know, find a way of, of visualizing this, I came up with, with a polar coordinate plot and something um, that we called the receptor fingerprint. Now, receptor fingerprints visualize the receptor balance um, of as many different receptor types as possible within a specific brain region. Um, so you've got the different receptor types analyzed here on each axis. Um, the scaling of the axis is the same for all receptor types. And then each one of these dots basically represents the, the density of, of that receptor in that brain area. And if we wanted to compare receptor fingerprints from different areas for the human eye, it's sort of like difficult to identify patterns if we've got these clouds of points. So that's why we we join um, these points with, with lines, okay? And um, because I don't just like ice cream, but I'm also um, a bit, you know, I like tidy things. I, I got rid of the dots to just make the plot look a bit um, tidier. And what you see here is then what we've called the receptor fingerprint, right? And if we compare receptor fingerprints from different areas, we see that uh, they can differ in their shape and or um, the size. And these are uh, the receptor fingerprints of areas that I've already mentioned in, in today's talk. So primary auditory cortex in blue, somatosensory in red, motor in green, and visual in um, yellow. And these differences in the size and the shape of receptor fingerprints are important because they provide information concerning the, um, the hierarchical organization of the areas that we're looking at and also the functional systems to which they belong, okay? At least this is the, the hypothesis that, that we were working with. And um, to prove uh, this hypothesis, uh, what we did was look at the receptor fingerprints of um, areas um, that belong to a system that, that is close to Steph's heart. So we, we, we were looking at, at language areas, specifically at, at areas that from functional imaging studies, we know that they're involved in um, the sentence comprehension network. And uh, these areas are the ones that are labeled here um, with in red font in, in, in this um, diagram. And we compared the fingerprints that we extracted from these areas with fingerprints of areas that, that aren't um, involved in this sentence comprehension network, right? And the position at which each one of these labels is, is placed indicates you know, the approximate location of, of that area in the brain. And we extracted receptor densities from all of these um, areas and what you see here are a couple of exemplary uh, receptor fingerprints, okay? And we could spend hours 
comparing these fingerprints and saying, well, I think that, that the fingerprint of area 44V is more similar um, to that of, of the posterior superior temporal gyrus superior uh, temporal sulcus region than it is to uh, the fingerprint of area 45P. And, oh, wow, it looks really different to the fingerprint of V1 or, or parietal area PGP. But in science, we don't want you know, to have just objective um, descriptions. We want to be able to to quantify things and we, we, we like statistics, okay, to be able to, to prove our point. So what we did was um, we performed hierarchical clustering analysis, um, which is an, an agglomerative, uh, descriptive statistical uh, procedure by which um, we could group areas together based on the similarities in the uh, their fingerprints, okay? So if you've got, um, and, and the result of this clustering analysis is represented is in, in this dendrogram. So if you've got areas uh, such as um, FG1 and FG2, which are really close here on this branch, right? That means that their fingerprints are very similar to each other. And, um, you can also determine statistically what is the the um, well biologically relevant or or the constant number of clusters it, which you could define within this dendrogram. Okay, and we found um, for this particular subset of areas that it was um, four clusters. And that meant that all of these areas that are involved in the sentence comprehension network, they were all found together in the same cluster, meaning that their receptor fingerprints were most similar or more similar to each other than, for example, to areas of the parietal lobe. Although these areas aren't necessarily all anatomically close to each other in the brain. OK, this is another important thing that it's it's not just a question of anatomical um, uh, uh, proximity. Um, it, it really is a question of similarity in neurochemical composition. Now, for those of you that know about language, you know that it is lateralized and, and that the left hemisphere is the dominant hemisphere. OK. If we do exactly the same analysis, so if we look at the receptor fingerprints of all of these areas, but we extract the densities from um, the right hemisphere, and we also perform a cluster analysis, what we found was that, that these areas of the Broca region um, still cluster together, but um, that the a posterior superior temporal gyrus uh, region, so the one which is in, in, you know, more in Wernicke's region here, posteriorly in the brain, that this was no longer in the same cluster, right? And we also found that area 47, although it's in, in close proximity to the Broca region, it didn't cluster with it anymore. So um, this is telling us something about the functional specificity of, of the molecular composition of these areas in the left hemisphere, the dominant one for, for language versus in the right hemisphere. And, and I'd like again to emphasize that these kind of findings, they can really only be achieved if you look at as many different receptor types as as possible, it's it's it, it doesn't work if you only look at one or or two different receptors, okay? And it doesn't even work really as well if you if you look at site architecture um, alone. Now, um, transmitter receptors don't just show uh, regional differences. Um, within the cortical ribbon, but they also uh, show a highly differentiated laminar organization, which um, is most definitely also uh, uh, related to um, functional differentiations, because we know that cortical layers differ in their input and output um, 
patterns in the brain, okay? And what this slide here shows is detailed views of the site architecture and the myel architecture, and then the distribution patterns of different receptor types in the primary visual cortex of, of the human um, brain. And what I've done here is um, with the white lines, I've, I've highlighted the, the position within the, the cortical ribbon of the genari stripe. So in all of these snippets here, the, the surface of the brain would be at the top of the snippet and the border between the cortex and the white matter would be here at the um, bottom of the snippet, right? And because all of these images have been taken from neighboring sections and, and each one of these sections is only 20 micrometers thick, um, I can transfer these white lines um, to the other images. And what you see here is that um, the, there is really no one-to-one -one correspondence um, between the lamina distribution patterns of the different receptors and that of the site architecture and um, the myel architecture. This is basically because receptors in the brain, uh, they are normally not found on the cell bodies um, of the neurons, which is what you would hear, see here with site architecture, but they're located on the dendritic tree. And for example, the dendrites of cells that are located in, in site architectonically identified layer five, the dendrites of these cells, they can reach all the way up into layer three, okay? Or even um, layer two. Um, now, in the previous slide, I only showed you the primary visual cortex. Here, I want to highlight the fact that within a given receptor type, um, here as an example, the muscarinic M1 receptor, areas, different cortical areas can also uh, differ in their laminar distribution patterns. And um, these differences don't just reflect uh, differences in, in uh, complexity of, of the laminar pattern of, of the area in question. Um, but that these differences in the laminar densities represent the molecular modulatory mechanism of connectivity of the receptor in question. Um, and, and it doesn't just reflect a, a difference in, in laminar complexity, which you could think if you say, well, look at this within the primary visual cortex, we can identify a sublamination in, in layer four, but not in layer three, and in area V2V, we can see a sublamination of, of layer three, but not of layer four, right? So it's it's not just these differences in the in the laminar complexity at, at the site architectonic level, because if you compare the receptor architecture, uh, within V1, we have one peak up here in the superficial layers, the so-called supergranular layers. And then we have a second maximum, although it's lower, but it is a second maximum in the deeper, in the infragranular layers. Whereas in the um, area V2V, we have this peak in you know, layer two, and, and then the densities of, of M1 receptor, they just uh, decrease um, gradually right down to the white matter border. Um, now, despite the, the laminar uh, differences between layers, we do have um, a general pattern that we see across um, different brain areas. And, and that is that we have generally highest densities of most receptor types analyzed. They're located in the superficial layers. Uh, we've got intermediate densities in granular layer four and lowest densities in, in the infragranular layers. And this is, is shown here by a couple of, of exemplary fingerprints. And some of you might be surprised uh, to see a, a granular layer here in, in area four, Brotman's area four, which is the primary motor cortex and which according to 
Rotman uh, did not have a, a layer four in the adult primate brain, uh, including the brain of humans, right? Um, and this is because also the reason why there's, there's a granular layer or densities for the granular layer here is because this lack of a, of a layer for this agranularity of, of uh, primary motor cortex is um, a question that is um, not agreed upon by all scientists. Um, so what we did in this study here was to identify um, a very thin uh, strip of cortex at the interface between layers three and um, five in area four to extract densities from a, a so-called granular layer. And we did this because we found um, that the laminar distribution of the nicotinic receptors highlights uh, a potential layer four in, in this part of the brain, okay? Um, differences in, in, I mentioned earlier on connectivity, and this is, is an aspect that is um, schematically represented in this slide here. Uh, so the superficial layers of the brain are the ones which are the main um, um, target of uh, cortical cortical input, whereas layer four is the main target of uh, thalamocortical input, so of input from, from the thalamus, and uh, the deeper layers are the ones um, that are mainly the source of output in the brain. And please excuse this representation here. There's a little mistake. This output part of the graph shouldn't start here in layer 4C. It should start down here, right? So I, I don't want to start a rumor saying that that um, layer 4C is, is an output layer. It's, it's not, it's not, okay? Um, well, what we have here is that these layers, which are basically the ones, uh, the, the main source of cortical cortical input, they are also the layers where if we add up the densities of all of the different receptor types that we analyze, um, these are the layers which show the highest percentage of, of receptors, okay? So, so layers two and three are the ones that generally present the highest densities of, of layers. And they also have the bigger fingerprints than um, the, the deeper cortical layers, okay? And interestingly, these layers where we have the highest receptor densities are in the visual cortex, also the layers that have the highest um, density of, of synapses. Um, now, if we take the receptor fingerprints of very many different areas in the human brain, fingerprints extracted from the, the superficial in blue and granular layer four in red and the, the deeper layers shown here in green, and we do a multidimensional scaling analysis, we see that um, uh, we've got an overall separation of the fingerprints from these three um, main uh, layers that can be uh, uh, identified within the cortical ribbon. Okay, this this separation happens along the first dimension of of um, the plot, and this is what we have called the natural axis of transmitter receptor distribution patterns. Okay, this um, segregation along the first dimension. Um, what this plot also shows is that along this natural axis of transmitter receptor distribution, we have a separation of air of areas that can be classified as being sensory in nature from areas that are multimodal uh, and association areas. Okay, we also see that. Uh, 
primary motor cortex and also area six, which belongs to the premotor cortex and which is also being characterized as being a granular in the um, adult human brain, um, that, that the fingerprints from, from these areas don't um, uh, follow the general trend of, of all other isocortical areas, telling us that they uh, hold a special position in this um, um, line from sensory to association areas. If we look at the second uh, dimension, it clearly separates um, the hippocampus, uh, which is one of the oldest cortical types from the evolutionary point of view. It is uh, an arch archicortical structure from areas which are, from the evolutionary point of view, newer. These are these ne neocortical areas also, um, which is the same. So neocortex and isocortex are mean exactly the same thing, okay? Now, we wanted to know if, if these differences in receptor densities could also be correlated with uh, other structural parameters in the brain. So for example, not just um, um, if, if, if we've got different areas, but also if there'd be uh, a correlation with the, the density of neurons that, that we find in a given brain area, the size of the dendrites, the number of synapses that these uh, neurons have, and also with connectivity levels, okay? And, and we performed this analysis in the macaque monkey brain, well, basically because we wanted to use hardcore connectivity data, and that really only exists for the macaque monkey brain. Okay, so, so when I say hardcore connectivity data, I mean tracer uh, studies and not connectivity as we can uh, study nowadays in the human brain by means, for example, of, of, of uh, diffusion, tension imaging, or uh, uh, functional connectivity studies, right? Um, and this kind of data, as I said, is available for the macaque monkey brain for, you know, quite a lot of areas. So we made use of this recycled data that was available in the literature. And the receptor data uh, came from an ongoing project in, in the receptor group, uh, which aims to create a multimodal uh, map of the macaque monkey brain, which will integrate the analysis of site architecture and of very many different receptor types. And we want to bring this into three-dimensional space so that it can be compared with, with all of these functional imaging studies that are now starting to be to, to appear also for the macaque monkey brain. And what this slide uh, here shows is, apart from a representation uh, of these areas on, on the surface of the Yerkes, Brain, so which we used as a uh, uh, the the stereotactic uh, space for for our um, areas are uh, um, sections through uh, the macaque monkey brain uh, and and labeled for the visualization of the adrenergic um, alpha one receptor, uh, showing the different areas and 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 also here in in the thalamus. Okay. And when we do a, um, a cluster analysis, what we what we find is that as as in the human brain, uh, macaque areas also cluster into rough anatom anatomo functional groups uh, in in receptor space. And again, we have a segregation of of sensory and association areas, and we have a se a, a segregation of of evolutionary old and, and newer um, areas, okay? And, and when we compare, what, what are the differences um, between fingerprints that, that we find uh, in, in these uh, different axes that, that we identify on and, and either side of them? Well, we find that um, basically uh, the, the number of receptors per neuron increases when we move from the sensory areas up to association areas. And we find 
that that the separation between these evolutionary older and newer areas is basically driven by the density of the 5-HT1A receptor, okay? Um, what we wanted to know also was how do these differences correlate with um, cortical hierarchy, which uh, was defined by laminar connectivity patterns. And what we here found was that neurons that are, are closer to the top of the hierarchy uh, and which contribute more to complex cognitive functions have higher receptor densities than, than ones that are lower down in the hierarchy. So we have a significant positive correlation, okay? And, and we found that this significant significant positive correlation could basically be explained also by a correlation in an increase in the dendritic tree size. Um, because the correlation that we found here with the number of, of spines per um, pyramidal cell was, was not significant, okay? So um, basically uh, what we've got is that that um, we need larger dendrites for the neurons to be able to house uh, a greater number of uh, synaptic connections and, and receptor densities. And another really nice thing that, that we found from this study was that if we project the first principal component um, of the um, receptor distribution pattern onto the surface of, of the macaque monkey template, the distribution pattern of, of uh, these principal component um, scores um, is highly reminiscent of the um, functional zones which Ma Marcel Mesulam um, defined in his seminal article on large-scale networks, okay? And he proposed the existence of functional zones within the cortex, each of which would be associated with specific cognitive processes. And he thought that these uh, zones were not necessarily localized or, or strictly localized or isolated, but they would be interconnected and would work uh, in coordination to basically achieve these uh, com complex um, cognitive tasks, right? And 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 this um, idea of his really challenged the simplistic view of the brain as a collection of isolated modules, which is basically what was what was thought of as brain function um, in 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 the day, right? Um, and and his his proposal really helped us understand the brain's organization in a more interconnected and dynamic uh, way. So with with our work on on receptor densities and how they relate to different uh, functional systems in the brain and and uh, these um, uh, um, axes that can be defined based on on differences in receptor distribution patterns um, we are providing you know crucial information on on how neuronal communication can be modulated at the neurochemical point of view between functional networks and with with this slide i'd, I'd like to finish i i'd like to emphasize the fact that i think that that the future of brain research has to be multi, right? We we need a multi-scale analysis, not just covering different scales, like from genes, molecules, uh, through, through cells, all the way up to, you know, whole brain analysis. But we also need to, to analyze multiple uh, timescales. Um, uh, it has to be multimodal. Uh, the more species we analyze, the better. And, and I think also a crucial thing for future studies is uh, we, we need to be more multidisciplinary. We need um, that people from, from different uh, backgrounds really collaborate more tightly with each other. And only this way will we be able to um, collect and analyze and visualize and interpret all of these findings um, in, a, in a meaningful way that will really help us advance our understanding of um, 
the relationship between brain structure and function. And with this, my very last slide, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. I'd like to uh, say thank you to my funders, obviously, for their um, support and my collaborators. Um, I really learned loads and loads from Isabel and Carmen about the, the thalamus and uh, from Sean and Xiaojing at New York University about you know, computational large-scale um, uh, networks. Sean is now leading his own group at uh, Bristol University. Thomas was a postdoc of mine. He's now at the Child Mind Institute. And then, well, my team, I'm really deeply indebted to them um, also for their, you know, not just for their hard work, but also for their personal support over the years. So, and with this, I've reached the end of today's talk. Thank you so much, Nicola. It's always nice to see familiar faces on the last slide as well. And I'm totally going to steal your hardcore connectivity data <laughs> for the future. <laughs> uh, very exciting talk. Uh, I want to open the floor for questions uh, that is in the room here, but also for the people watching us live on YouTube. If you have questions and want to write them in the chat, I'm more than happy to bring them into the Zoom room. Um, and I'm happy. Oh, yeah. Oh. One hand is up already. You're faster than me, go for it. <laughs> Hi, Nicola. That was amazing. Um, I was wondering, did you um did you look at the distribution of the receptor in different human sample and how do they vary from one another? Right. Uh, yes, I did look at different individuals. Um not too many. I know, not too many because of the enormous financial and get, also technical imagine, imagine. problems associated yeah. with this. But we've got four entire human brains processed with receptor autoradiography, and then also, you know, small blocks from, from many other different brains. Okay. And what I see is that yes, there are individual differences in absolute expression levels, right? Um, just the same as some people are taller or smaller or thinner or fatter than others. Um, but the important thing and why our findings, despite the relatively small sample size, is that, that the relative differences when you compare different areas within a brain, they remain constant. So, for example, the fact that M2 receptor densities are significantly higher in the primary visual cortex compared to the secondary, compared to V3, V4. That is something that remains constant across all subjects that we've analyzed. Thank you. Great. Annie, you're next. Uh, yeah, hi, and thanks for the very enlightening talk. Uh, me, myself, my background, I'm a neurolinguist, but more the linguist than the neural part. So it was really informative, very easy to follow. Thank you. Um, and my question is also concerning uh, the language. Um, yeah, I, I guess you could call it networks, because in the end, you're showing which ones are, yeah, mm -hmm. in a similar way. Uh, and the ones you showed were concerning comprehension. And I was wondering if you kind of had a pre-selection, which areas you were looking into anyways, or if it was more like an, I don't know, side effect of, of this network showing up. And um, and secondly, if the, you also had looked into the production side of it. Okay. Uh, so question one, uh, we the, the, the areas that we selected were selected based on, on their, their functional activation. So we knew ahead of time that they were involved in the sentence comprehension network. Um, I don't know about the section, the, the um, uh, 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 language production, because we haven't looked at that yet. Um, so it's it's a really really time consuming labor to obtain these densities, right? But what you are asking is something that that I hope will be possible in the in the near future, because I mentioned Thomas, who, who, who was a postdoc in my group. He's been working on the 3D reconstruction of these two dimensional sections. OK, and um, 
and and we we are almost ready. We almost have three dimensional volumes, which will code for the distribution of all of these receptors in the entire brain, meaning that that what what you'd be able to do is. And, and this is going to be in, in stereotactic space, me meaning that you'll be able to, to bring the receptor data into the, the space in which you've done your functional analysis, in which you've got the, the result of your, of your analysis, and you'll be able to then compare the, the receptor architecture of your different activation foci. And, uh, and then you'd be able to answer the question that you just asked, which is really interesting, because now with the study that I presented, we just looked at sentence comprehension versus areas that are not involved in um, language at all. Well, no, that's not quite true because, well, but not involved in sentence comprehension. But the question is, if you if you look at sentence comprehension, what happens to areas within Wernicke, for example, or or as you say, you know, sense comprehension versus sense production. Yeah, it's a super interesting question. Well, thanks a lot. I'll be on the lookout for it then in the future. Very exciting future research. Uh, Anna, you're next. Hi, um, thank you very much for the talk. I was wondering about the receptor fingerprints between macaques and uh, humans. Um, so you were showing uh, slices, right, where you compared the M. Now it moved. Uh, the M1 receptor, uh, M2 receptor, yeah. um, and um, you were looking at uh, visual areas, right? So V1, V2, V3. So I would assume, okay, well, macaques have eyes, humans have eyes. The uh, I would assume that we have quite similar receptors there. Have you uh, also taken a look at? Um, uh, at areas that, for example, language, where we would assume, okay, there might be differences. Um, yeah. Um, are um, though are there the um, the receptor um, fingerprints? Do they differ there between macaques and humans? Because I know that, for example, for connectivity fingerprints, uh, the work of uh, Rohir Mars, for example, there he can actually show um, really beautifully based on uh, those yeah, mm. fingerprint uh, plots, um, really cool differences between uh, connectivity in different species. Right, well, I, I, I haven't yet compared the fingerprints of, um, of Broca's region areas with, with, you know, with the putative homologue in the macaque monkey brain. Um, so, I wouldn't be able to tell you that. I'd I'd expect larger differences between Broca region areas and visual areas. Um, the fingerprint of the monkey brain isn't exactly the same as the fingerprint of the human brain um, in 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 terms of when we're comparing homolog areas. Um, because, because, for example, we've got a higher density of neurons in the macaque monkey brain than, than we have in the human brain, because in the human brain, in the cortex, there's more space dedicated for, for, for dendrites, for, for what's called neuropil that the, and, and basically enables, um, the connectivity, right? Um, but the principles that we have that, that enable um, visualization of, of, of hierarchical levels, they remain um, the same. And I actually have just starting a collaboration with Rohia where we want to use the, the receptor densities uh, also to, to enrich his model with the receptor densities. So again, this is also something that we should be able to, 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 um, to analyze in, in the future. Um, and, and look at these comparability of the different systems and how good a model is a given species for the human brain. Sounds exciting. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. So much exciting new research coming our way. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Uh, Eva, you have a question. 
Uh, yeah, thank you for the talk again. And I was wondering this uh, 3D space that you're building, if the uh, layer, um, the layers would be preserved and if there are any hopes to then use this with la uh, layer fMRI. Yes. So, so any anything involving 3D reconstructions means that you're going to have to interpolate. So we are going to lose a bit of resolution in these 3D volumes, but we're not going to lose the laminar information completely. Um, what I'd what I'd say was, you know, the the images that I showed uh, before. Let's say if if you put a filter over them and maybe a, I don't know, let's say something like a three kernel filter or something. So so they are going, the borders between, between receptor architectonically layers are going to get slightly blurred, but definitely the, 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 there's, there's going to be laminar information there and it would be really nice to compare it with, with laminar fMRI data. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Misha's back. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering how do um those bus motor and motor radiographer map compared to the PET result from uh, the paper from Anson? Um, you, you probably look from very close at those map, and uh, so so what did you see? No, l listen. Um, as long as you use the same kind of substance to label the receptor, the maps are identical. Well, not, not identical because, because the resolution is much higher in receptor autoradiography than with PET, okay? But but they're, they're the same, they're comparable, okay? But you have to use the same um, compound or at least a compound which is neurochemically um, comparable for both modalities. And, and I stress this because uh, you can, for example, if you want to label the, uh, the muscarinic M2 receptor, which is a really nice receptor, and I showed it a couple of times now because it highlights um, you know, the, the primary sensory area so beautifully. Um, you can label the M2 receptor using an agonist or using an antagonist. So, so a, a ligand that either binds to the high affinity or the low affinity um, level of the receptor. And depending on whether you use the agonist or the antagonist to label the M2 receptor, you will get a completely different um regional distribution pattern okay using exactly the same method so i've got i've got neighboring sections uh, in the human brain in the macaque monkey brain which have been processed using either um oxotemurine or afdx and um and it looks like completely different receptors okay so so that's why um if if you compare a PET image that was that was obtained using an, an agonist with with a receptor autoradiograph that was obtained using an antagonist, don't expect to find the same regional distribution patterns. But if you used agonists in both uh, methods, then yes. Right. Uh, I'm going to have to build this into my talk. Because it's a, it's a question that the people have have asked me in the past. Yeah, that, that, yeah, uh, I question myself as as well. Uh, and and my other question is like you you show those beautiful asymmetries in in the um, hierarchical relationship in receptors in the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, um, putatively related to language. Yeah. Uh, but that would mean if they have different receptor profile in the right hemisphere versus to the left hemisphere, or they associate with other regions, that connectivity should also be different, whether it is functional or structural connectivity with the well, rest of the brain. Well, well when you talk about co connectivity, well, 
But the the, the axle the axle that they exchange with was a break yeah. that should be different. Yes. Well, um, uh, this is a very difficult question, Mitch. Difficult because I'm 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 not an expert in language and and I, and I must confess that I'm not particularly interested in left right differences. Oh. Basically, basically, because um, because the thing is, I only have this sample of four brains, and and I don't feel comfortable doing an analysis where I compare, you know. Four brains, left hemisphere. Uh, so, sorry, four left hemispheres with four right hemispheres. Okay, okay, from the statistical point of view, the the analysis that we did that I presented earlier on, we did because the reviewers basically forced us to do it. Um, I'm the, these these differences in the in the densities that we find. Um, now, correct me, but but aren't there also haven't functional imaging studies identified um um asymmetries, asymmetries yeah, yeah, concerning yeah. concerning uh uh like size of of fiber tracts uh connecting um language related yeah 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 yeah, yeah, so, yeah, the, yeah. so the question is is this is this you know number of of axons connecting the different areas or there might be a you know those areas might connect different areas in the right hemisphere than in the left hemisphere because they belong to different yeah and, and because they've got a different weight. I think the interesting thing is that that the that areas of the Broca region so 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 Broca region in in the classical sense basically you know mm -hmm. 44 45 and, and the subdivisions that we found um that that they remain together regardless to you know the hemisphere that they're in and it's only it, it's it's this you know superior temporal gyrus superior temporal sulcus region that whoops sort of like disappears and and also area 47 um which some people do say should be part of the broca region but others don't include in the broca region so nobody knows Question. So um, I mean, I ask you exactly about that because you have this entire range of forty-seven, forty-five, forty-four, and some even include uh, ventral premotor area six. Well, you, you know, I didn't emphasize it during the talk. I noticed, <laughs> but yes, it's, it's not just ventral premotor areas, right? So these areas that are that are in the in the inferior frontal sulcus. I mean they 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 are there but it's also um we extracted densities from two parts of the primary motor cortex okay we mm -hmm. extracted receptor densities from from the hand knob region of the primary motor cortex and from the face representation and we found that the fingerprint from the face representation part of the motor cortex clustered with this which is very funny because it's it's the it's the language it's the sentence comprehension network but still you know primary motor cortex controlling facial features yeah. facial features was was associated with it but not the one for a hand although as i'm happily doing here and you can see some people use their hands a lot while they're talking as well well, that that's a topic that's completely understudied still, right? The, yeah. the importance of gestures when we speak. Um, Michelle subtly lets me know that I cut him off. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, not at all. Now I had another question that can came back to me. Uh, but but ask your question, Steph. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, well, yeah. So that question was addressed. Uh, two more questions i have for you the one is a bit more speculative i guess and one is a bit more ignorance on my side so in terms of speculation you you only have those four brains but would you expect a different distribution of pattern across the lifespan so in children for example a different developmental pattern of receptors but also then connected with neurological psychiatric diseases later on 
And would that potentially also be a target for therapeutic interventions? Um, oh, yeah, that's a that's a really difficult question. So I know that there are age related changes in the densities of some receptor types and in some brain regions, right? Um, the problem is that there's no comprehensive study that is that has analyzed everything. So some studies, you know, I suppose the people, they were particularly interested in a specific receptor type or a specific brain region. Um, so it's really difficult to say, do I think that, that for example, let's say the fingerprint of V1 will, will um, change throughout lifespan uh, and if suddenly the one in an adult brain won't express um, a significantly higher density of M2 receptors than, than the neighboring cortex I, I don't think so so much in aging to tell you the truth from, from, the, from what I've seen in the literature no definitely um, I mean if we're talking about fetal situation and maybe peri birth there maybe yes um and the problem is we yeah well we don't have the tissue i i i, I don't know um that's a very difficult yes very difficult Keep the and most I've, difficult questions for the end of the session <laughs> i've i've forgotten your second question was uh, therapeutic targets. Ah, yes. Yes, so so receptors can be therapeutic targets and, and this kind of research could find it. And I, I have analyzed, so I had a collaboration once with um, uh, um, somebody in the Netherlands. They were looking at progressive supranuclear palsy and um, they found in, in another study that... that uh, um, some of their patients had a, a faster um, cognitive uh, deterioration than other ones, and and they found that that the mid cingulate cortex was the the part of the brain that that explained um, uh, this this difference in 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 the way the the, the the patients lost their cognitive ability or, or the speed with which uh, patients lost their cognitive abilities. Um, so, so they asked me to do a, a receptor analysis and, and we found um, significant differences. Um, but to tell you the truth, the, the problem, so we, we found significant differences in mid cingulate cortex of PSP patients versus versus controls we we couldn't in the, in that sample we we couldn't see you know long versus or so so slower versus more rapidly evolving patients differences we didn't have that information final question from my end <laughs> um so we often think about anatomy as we know it all is set in stone and then every now and then there's new discoveries and we find new structures or and I was wondering I think on one of your slides you said there's 17 receptors did I remember this correctly well up up to now we've analyzed 17 receptors yeah. Yeah, no we, no we've and we so I show 17 receptors we, mm -hmm. we've analyzed about 20 different binding sites because for some of the receptors that I've shown um we've got the agonistic and the antagonistic binding site uh we, we don't normally this has this, this is also financial you know constraints we don't normally look at at both binding sites types in in all tissue samples we tend to do that uh, in the case when we are analyzing or you know comparing a disease model with with um 
uh, uh, control. So, for example, in epilepsy patients, we have looked at the GABA-A receptor at the lower and the high affinity binding sites for the GABA-A receptor. And we find significant differences um, for only one of the types and not, not for the other one, which, which has you know, functional implications for, for the disease. Thank you. But yeah, so it, there's a limit to the amount of ligands that are commercially available. That's one of the limitations. And there's also a limit to, to how many sections you can get from one um, brain. Yeah. And there's a limit to how much you can pay. Fair enough. Uh, I'm aware of the time. It's time to pick up the kids soon. So Mish, final question. Thank you. Um, so in this beautiful principal component analysis that you show where you identify you know, what those two axes mean. You also also show that area six and area four have been drifting quite a lot toward like the associative side. And um, that's, that's a result that we picked up on our side as well when we look at the viability of the brain and make a link with evolution. We were surprised to see that area six and area four were also very variable from one human brain to another. And we're like, what really happened in there? Is there like a thread of evolution did you look in macaque if there was like the same high level you know like drifting of area six and four on this axis so uh, how do you explain it um like, what do you imagine it is yes i know well no i didn't look in the macaque monkey because in the macaque monkey brain we uh we looked at mean regional differences so mean as in averaged over all cortical layers um, we, we, we do find that, that, uh, layer, um, sorry, not layer, sorry, that, that, uh, area, um, for, uh, in, in the monkey brain also behaves in a, in a completely, um, different manner, um, so I would expect it to, to merge out as well. Um, you know, I think maybe... You know, we talk about primary visual, primary auditory, primary sensory, and, and, and we always think about these areas because they are the first part of the brain where we become conscious of, you know, seeing, hearing, feeling something. And then we talk about the primary motor cortex um, that, that people or at least I know I did that as a, as a PhD student, or the first time when I heard the words primary visual, primary motor, I thought, right, well, the primary visual cortex and the primary motor cortex are at the same hierarchical level in the brain. Um, but I think that that's actually not the case. I think that what our yeah, results are highlighting is that, the, that they're very, very different. You know, they're both classified as primary areas but um i am wondering if if it, there must be in the brain there must be some kind of a global hierarchy right you, you know we've, we've got hierarchies within the different um sensory systems those are things that people have have been analyzing those are things that that Mesulam, for example talked about but but is there something in the brain that that's like a hierarchy of hierarchies? Mm -hmm. And could it be that the primary motor cortex is this overall boss? Or definitely not, definitely not an area that we receive primary input. It sends a primary output. It's it's it's, it's the primary it's the, output. That would be at the opposite of. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, yeah. so, 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 so that's probably that's why it was called, you know, primary area because it's the primary output, <clears throat> but it receives input from yeah everybody. Everybody in the yeah, I see what you mean. And it has to be mon monitoring, mm. and it's just the same thing as as when you think about motor. You know, when you think about motor functions, and if you do an fMRI, well, you'd only expect or people that don't know about it, they'd only expect an activation in the primary motor cortex, right? right. 
Right. Because, well, I'm I'm only moving, I'm only tapping my finger. Uh, they, they don't expect that that you also have a whole lot of sensory input because yeah. because your body is is telling you exactly where your finger is right now. As the SMA um, so exactly. So, and, yeah. so 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 in that sense, this this could be an explanation for for area four and area six to be way out there. I see. Very cool. Very cool. Feels like we're entering the matrix now. The yes. hierarchy of hierarchies. <laughs> yeah, well, these are these are these are hypothetical, you know, these are things that we still have to prove. That's good. Keeps us busy. <laughs> right. I'm gonna call it because I'm aware that people need to run and I'm also aware that we probably exhausted you at this point. So thank you so, so much, Nicola, for joining us today and also being the concluding talk of 2023. Oh, wow, okay. Well, it was a, it was a pleasure being here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, grand finale. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope to see you soon again. Thank you I'll so much. You soon. Take care.